dominated uh, this uh, panel or round table. Um, one of them should actually sit here and moderate. Now, I happen to be the ARD president and they felt I should. And then I was wondering, we can turn it into a positive because it shows we are not excluding otherness. Even white men are still allowed to contribute to a relevant debate. And for that I am grateful. Because we set an example <coughs> contrasting it to others who emphasize exclusivity and impose hegemonic discourses and marginalize people and abuse the power of definition. We in EAD are not doing that. But we in EAD are determined not to allow in our activities any all-male, all-white panels any longer. And I think for that we deserve credit. Um, our world is diverse and we cannot and should not be reduced to hegemonic tunnel visions abusing the power of definition. Now that's all I have to say because now I need to accept and respect the place being the moderator and humbly listen to the other voices for which we provide the floor. They represent the diversity we are looking for despite the fact that due to material constraints they are all UK based. Uh, that's part of the harsh realities in our world. But with Uma Kotari from the University of Manchester, we have an ERD vice president sitting here who works since decades, despite looking younger, but since decades, <laughs> on migration, racism, and post-coloniality. Um, then we have Nivi Manjanda from Queen's University, working on post- and decolonial theory on knowledge production and hegemonic discourses with which we are confronted all the time in our efforts to produce genuine knowledge. Or actually, as we discussed this morning in another <coughs> session, it should be always in the plurality. Like identities, there are knowledges. And I think that is one of the challenges, how to translate that into practical production of knowledges on a level playing field. And last but not least, Olivia rota from the University of Portsmouth, who works on decolonizing the thinking and on international solidarity and has a specific focus on the interventionist strategies of the current US imperialist administration, which might be the tip of the iceberg, but uh, it's the tip of an iceberg of a much more fundamental and global system which starts with the internalized mental hierarchies we are confronted with. We start the round table by spontaneous questions to each of the panelists, uh, very spontaneous, made up a week ago, and they will very spontaneously reply with ad hoc remarks uh, to a maximum of 10 minutes, and then we hope to very soon open that round table to an exchange among all of us, because that's another aspect of uh, reducing hierarchies. It's not us, they sitting here who claim to have the absolute knowledge and you are supposed to listen. No. We would like to see an interaction unfolding and I think it takes place as an outside observer on one of the, for me, most visible battlegrounds called Great Britain, where the notion of empire is reactivated to an extent where I follow with almost uh, fear what's going on here in those ideological battlegrounds. <coughs> uh, but as I said, it's not me who should talk. So, Uma, what is the colonial genealogy you refer to as integral part of the history of development? Ten minutes. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, th thanks, Henning, and thanks to ERD for organizing this round table, which I think is incredibly important. Of course, it, it's ad hoc and spontaneous, <laughs> <laughs> my ten minutes. Um, but just in case I forget something. Um, so I finished my PhD, so now I'm going way back um, in 1991, and the first job I got was in the geography department at Newcastle. And uh, when I arrived there, I had to teach a course jointly 
with uh, one of the senior academics there, who I, I won't name because I think he's still around, and he'd been a former colonial administrator. And I had to teach this course, and uh, man and his physical environment. Well, I was at Newcastle for nine months, and my one, the one good thing I did was make sure that title changed. Um, <clears throat> but he used to start every lecture with when I was on the Zambezi. And, um, and so I, I, I wanted to start with that, because then I came to Manchester, and four of my colleagues had been former colonial administrators. And in both institutions, I was the first woman and the first non-white um, academic to be appointed there. Um, and so I start with that sort of anecdote, because I want to say that a lot has changed. A lot has changed. I want to say that first, because the rest of my nine and a half minutes is that much stays the same. Um, so I want to make just some general uh, comments, uh, very general comments, and much of this, of course, is known um, to most of you. And two main remarks, uh, which are largely informed, as Henning just sort of implied, by British colonial history and its sphere of interest. So looking really at the British uh, development industry. But I hope that it has wider resonances for people, and I'd love to hear views of people from different geographical and historical perspectives. So first, I want to focus on the significance of history and of understanding the past in continuing to shape contemporary, persistent, and growing inequality. So basically, history matters, and you all know that. But I think we have to be attuned to how the past, and particularly a colonial legacy, continues to shape the form and the extent of contemporary inequalities. And more than that, how not taking history seriously risks present, preventing us from addressing these inequalities. And then I want to suggest just one way that we can begin to achieve, to challenge, to move forward a greater equity. And I want to argue that it's to develop new kinds of solidaristic principles. Um, so I don't mean us you know, standing with sort of raised fists, although that's great, seeing the internationale in Italian, that's mm -hmm. great too. But what I want to talk about is that these solidaristic principles may um, be found in very mundane spaces. That, that we don't tend to um, focus on very often. And uh, they're nurtured, I want to argue, in everyday encounters and interactions. So first of all, history matters then. So we all know very well that colonialism survived the demise of empires. And the historical uh, effects of colonialism persist uh, today in the different forms of power and knowledge. You just have to walk through Manchester. We have Asia House down the road here. Uh, you look at who with the people here. Some of you have said you went to Chinatown. Uh, others of you might have gone to what is called, and I hate to say this, the Curry Mile. Um, I wouldn't call anything served on that mile curry, personally. Um, but now I think there's many reasons why we need to look at this. And the first is that development itself is founded on the forging of distances and differences. So foundational to development, most significantly the idea of development is based on a colonialist assumptions that some people and places are less developed than others. Right. So subsequently, at the outset, it depends on us identifying who are those people who are more developed than others. Um, and very often, that's a racialized subject. The poor, the marginalized, vulnerable, the recipient of interventions, as distinct then from those who are developed and can legitimately bestow ideas about modernity, about progress, morality, and civility. So we have this colonial binary where development is about the interventions, mainstream development, um, which is all about ensuring that there is a shift, a cultural shift from traditional to modern, a moral shift from bad to good, bad governance, good governance, a temporal shift from past to future, a spatial one, third to first world, and a political one, autocratic to democratic. And those binaries, I want to argue, um, are foundational to the rationale and the justification for some people intervening in the lives of others. The second reason that history matters, and I know this is known to you, is that we tend to neglect the colonial genealogy of development, despite its continuity. And I think there's a number of reasons for that. Any development textbook, you open it up, it starts with Truman's speech, 1945, and it cuts off that longer history. So it bounds development, it delimits the history of development as if it started in 1945. We rehearse that so often, and students' essays begin with Truman's speech, and we rehearse it so often that we actually think that was the beginning of development. So that's one reason why we neglect to think about the colonial legacy. The second is 
um, the SDGs, targets, goals, it's all future oriented. Like five year plans, mid, mid year reports, anyone who's had research funding, anyone who's worked in development projects, it's all future oriented. And so what we do is conceal that historical legacy. And I think there's been a political imperative to distance what we do in development from the colonial encounter. So we don't want to tarnish development with colonialism. Because development is about humanitarianism, it's about doing good, and colonialism was bad and exploitative. So there's nothing new in men much of that, and post-colonial critics have highlighted these concerns by doing two main things. The first is to highlight the colonial legacy of, contemporary, of the contemporary moment, and second, to provide alternative narratives, different stories, alternative versions. But I want to raise a couple of recent developments. And the first is that some argue, many of my colleagues will say to me, um, my colleagues whom I'm very fond of and I cherish, but they'll say to me, come on, Omar, move on. Right? Move on, this is historically deterministic. Right? And I understand what they say. That if we say that global inequalities persist and are growing because of a specifically <laughs> colonial past, that means that we can never move forward because we can't change that past. Right? So that this is a historical determinism. The thing is, though, that conceiving of the past as, irrele as irrelevant has devastating consequences, I would argue, for justice. And Joan Tronto writes in, in a brilliant article called Time's Place, in order to move towards responsible accountability, we need to remain vigilant to those historical relations which may remain hidden, unrecognizable, or have mutated. We can't just ignore past injustices, obscuring them in order to create a new equitable future. So despite how we have begun to problematize, decenter, etc., Western knowledge, and resist the variety of ways in the West in the ways in which the West produces knowledge about other people, I think little attention continues to be paid to the role of history in shaping unequal relations. And even if we want to move on, even if I do take what my colleagues say seriously, um, parts of the world that we write about, that we carry out research in, our relations with them, indeed our very own societies in the West, continue to articulate a colonial legacy. To look at tan those people who work on, on land tenure systems, I mean, where did they come from? Even if you look at housing, how cities have developed, urban planning. I mean, you can't study Mumbai without thinking about colonial architecture and how the city has been spatialized in particular ways. Um, so that's the second point. And the third is, and this really worries me um, greatly, and I hear it everywhere, and I feel this has become a bit of a mantra for me, so apologies if you've heard this before, but I get the sense in the way in which we talk about um, China really problematic. I think we've started to pathologize China. I think it's racialized. We vilify China, but look at China, look at China. China's doing this, China's doing that. Well, the, the British, British aid did exactly the same thing. They built infrastructure and bridges and exchanged that for British, the exchange of steel and trade. So development aid did benefit the British, um, British trade and British exchange and, and knowledge um, exchange. So I'm worried about the way in which we speak about China. I feel that it's really problematic. So I do feel that there is still a colonizing discourse, even though the actors in development have changed, right? And there are more and new actors in development. So bring, I want the second thing that I want, so that's history matters. The second is to bring back and reinvigorate notions and practices of solidarity, specifically a more public, mundane, routine, and habitual form of solidarity. The kind that's found in day-to-day -day encounters and interactions. So an everyday solidarity that refers both to formal and informal practices of care for others that's based much more on mutual recognition. And in 1968, Hannah Arendt wrote that we must strive for a world in common. But she recognized that how difficult this was to achieve. And she was referring to refugees in the Second World War. And she said that we saw them as superfluous people. And what she meant by that was that they had no state and no citizenship rights. But they also had no visibility. That is, they weren't seen to have any agenda presence. They didn't, weren't seen to have any agency. Um, so they, they, they didn't appear to act and speak in public. And in such a way that they became removed from the public and political sphere. And all they had left was their biological life. And I look at some of humanitarian discourses now at post-conflict, 
um, and, and some of the practices around that. And I think that people are recognized as being human, but at the same time, they're not humanized. And this is what Arendt was talking about in 1968. So I don't think we've moved very far from those, those kinds of dehumanizing representations. And we just have to look at the ways in which the media represents refugees today, the swarms, the tsunami, the floods of refugees, that those kinds of representations, they're seen as having bodies, biological life, but they're dehumanized in particular ways. So I think the one area that continues to bedevil our attempts at achieving social justice is that we simply are unable to see other people as our contemporaries. They're always seen as being different. We mark them out as different. Um, okay, so solidarity, I would argue, is not merely invoked or forged at distinct critical moments, but rather emerges over time in everyday contexts. So substantive solidarity is likely to be found amid the mundane rhythms of daily life rather than in the mission statement of a global charity or through visual iconographies of famine or inequality. So simply put, I see the primary causes of global inequalities as based not only in a historical and specifically colonial legacy, but in recent attempts to ignore or rewrite this history. And besides acknowledging the past, one way forward may be found in everyday forms of conviviality and solidarity. Thanks. Sorry, Henning. Thanks so much. A necessary reminder as a point of departure that uh, the past is not dead, it's not even past. Uh, so, Nibi, very spontaneously again, <laughs> how should post and decolonial theories best acknowledge and approach the legacy in current studies of world politics and how should knowledge production reflect these dimensions adequately? Thank you, and thank you for organizing this and having me here. I'm not a development studies person, as will become clear, but hopefully some of what I'm talking about speaks to those concerns. Um, and I'm going to answer that question, but in a kind of roundabout way. So the current study of world politics, I would argue, ranges from quite nuanced, granular, historically sensitive, to the exclusionary, myopic, and downright racist. The latter of these has been canonized by the discipline in which I belong, which is called international relations. So if development studies sort of makes the object of its focus the third world or the wretched of the earth in as Eurocentric and as patronizing a way possible, IR, even though it claims to be studying the world, mostly erases the world's presence. Um, global politics normally in international relations is refracted through the prism of theories that are orientalist and they're dressed up in like pseudo-scientific garb some of you may have heard of the liberal peace thesis, which says that liberal democracies are inherently more peaceful, whereas the rest of the world and other social political entities are almost inherently um, violent. And this is, called, this is called the only law of international relations. Um, the problem with these theoretical approaches is manifold, but perhaps the most obvious for like, our purposes here is that they don't really tell us anything about what, how this world came to be who the people inhabiting this world are, and the violence and injustices that are meted out uh, to those in the global south on an everyday basis, right? So a potted sort of plant version of states and institutions is taken as a, a priori in international relations, and the colonial genealogy of contemporary politics is completely erased or neglected or just not seen as important at all. So we must start, start, start derogating this. This has been done, but I feel like this, it's quite urgent and quite um, raw at the moment, especially in the context of far-right nationalism and crypto-fascism that is gaining in, the, in Europe and the rest of the world. So when international relations, and of course I'm caricaturing a bit here, but only a bit, um, when international relations studies other, other people, uh, much like development studies, much like knowledge production in the West, a solipsism, even a sort of arrogance, is clearly at play. And to give an example of this, I'm going to take uh, something that I've done in my own research, uh, which was focused very much on Afghanistan until recently. And I'm talking about a specific sort of uh, exhibit on Afghanistan. Afghanistan usually doesn't get quite a place at all, so it's quite, quite remarkable that there is such an exhibit. But in 2014, in the Imperial War Museum in, uh, in London, there was an uh, object of interest gallery which focused on Afghanistan. 
one of the things that was most prominently displayed at this gallery was an Afghan school book, which uses bullets and Kalashnikovs as counting tools. And um, so it's an illustrated children's counting textbook for about eight-year-olds, and it references apples and oranges, one apple, two apples, alongside uh, mujahid and jihad and rifles, sort of in the same thing. So those are used as numerical aids. I wanted to bring it up, but I couldn't. Uh, you can find it online. So, the, Nash, so the, the, the website for this Objects of Interest notes, and I'm going to quote here. The book dates from the Islamic year 1356, in brackets, circa 1986, during the Soviet war in Afghanistan. Its warlike content is a stark reminder of the lasting legacy of conflict in modern Afghan society, end quote. And the curator, Mary O'Hara, um, talks about this and she elucidates and she kind of tells us not to judge too harshly. So she says, to preempt hasty judgment, uh, she says war, and I quote, is part of the fabric of daily life in Afghanistan. And she also argues that while these tools may sort of seem sinister to us, this is very normal for them and we should try to understand that these are sort of pedestrian objects of their society. Now, this can be read as some sort of like laudable intervention into understanding the lives of the other, or it can be read as what it is, which is how, which is, a, which, wait, wait, I'll get into that in a second, but what the exhibition and its curators fail to mention is how these textbooks came into being. So during the mid-1980s, a US aid-funded project printed millions of textbooks in Peshawar that were distributed to school children across Afghanistan. The textbooks were designed by Americans to indoctrinate Afghans against the evils of the Soviet Union and made for immensely po powerful propaganda. <coughs> Specialists from the Afghanistan Center at the University of Nebraska, Omaha, received $51 million to develop a curriculum that glorified jihad, celebrated martyrdom, and dehumanized foreign invaders, mostly in the form of the Soviet Union. Published in Dari and Pashtu, these school books taught the alphabet through Kalashnikovs, counting through guns and bullets, and drew on conflict scenarios, deploying various firearms in, in inventive ways. So to take one example, and I'm going to quote again, a Kalashnikov bullet travels at 800 meters per second. A Mujahid has the forehead of a Russian in his sights, 3,200 meters away. How many seconds will it take the bullet to hit the Russian's forehead? Question mark. Although the US aid funding for the project stopped in 1994, multiple copies of the text remained in circulation in the 1990s and in 2000s. The Taliban, in another grisly turn, continued using these American-produced textbooks, but in keeping with their fabricated scripture, denounced all physical representation of human images and so cut off the heads of these uh, Mujahids, right? So, so what remained were these beheaded sort of uh, people carrying Kalashnikovs and very poignant pedagogical instruments for eight-year-olds. What this tells us as an instance of knowledge production is that, one, the implication of the colonized and the colonizer is completely erased, the actual histories are paid no heed at all, and there's a stunning disregard even for any sort of veracity, however questionable it may be. So to start <coughs> decolonizing or thinking about how we might stop producing knowledge in a certain kind of way, and you've already mentioned how thinking of knowledge as a unitary knowledge without an S is problematic, we still need to start thinking about knowledge is. Uh, we must start questioning our own assumptions and problematizing our common sense. But we should also perhaps think about the, the role of us as producers. Are we really producing knowledge about the other? Perhaps we should stop looking at ourselves as like these heavy-handed product producers that go into the world and tell, us, tell, tell it what it is. We should maybe think of ourselves as conveyors of traditions, or cultivators, or interpreters, or whatever. The producers in itself is quite, quite, a, quite a heavy sort of mantle to bear. Um, some of you may have come across this our article by Jan and Tuck, which says decolonizing should not be used as a metaphor. And I agree that decolonization should not be used uh, in a sort of stripped down diversity agenda. But the decolonization of knowledge production, if you like, is important and even a first step in the sort of bigger project towards the reclamation of land, the reassertion of cultural or traditional ways, and of redistributive justice. So that's how I would kind of argue. Uh, I'll stay a question. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Nivi, especially with this uh, illustration that reminds us that the so-called monsters uh, from the perspective of so-called Western civilization are produced in the womb of so-called Western civilization. They are an invention of the West, and they are the mirror image in which you project your superiority claims. Meanwhile, they come from your own mindset. I think that's something we very often tend to forget in this dichotomy between the we and the they divide. The they are a reflection of what we made up in them instead of being created by them as individual acting subjects. Um, and in that sense, decolonization of knowledges should be aware of that, that a hegemonic discourse creates pseudo-identities elsewhere. Um, Olivia? Spontaneous third question. <laughs> what are the implications of giving due recognition of decoloniality in international development and developmentalism? So mine is almost like really spontaneous. It's just these <laughs> notes. <laughs> so my name is Olivia and I am, um, I guess we're, we're a good trio. I'm somewhere in between in a sense that I would define myself more as an international relations scholar that ended up having to teach international development studies. So somewhere in the middle. Uh, but uh, in my own research, I started focusing on the European Union, its relations with the Global South and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa in particular. And even if you call yourself an IR scholar, you end up being a development scholar as soon as you talk about Africa. So somewhere, <laughs> I guess. Uh, um, so I indeed want to focus on the implications uh, and I will build also on some of uh, the things that have been said before. And um, the context, I guess, of, of what I'm going to talk about is a bit um, a continuation of both a talk I gave at Sussex, which I titled um, on uh, babies and bathwater. And my question basically is, let's say that we want to hold on to the idea of solidarities, global solidarity, justice and all these things. And if we take as a starting point and as an assumption that a lot of the international aid and development sector and thinking and practices is indeed a continued expression of coloniality. So I'm sure that we can discuss it, but let's say that in this intervention, I'm gonna take that as a given. Um, what are the implications practically when it comes to our institutions in which we do these things, but also maybe as educators, um, facilitators, how we call it, in front of the classroom, let's say, but also for our own research. And I guess given, given that I only have 10 minutes, I'll focus mostly on institutions and maybe uh, the classroom. Um, and and the, the origin of this thinking was that uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we were in, um, in Helsinki at a postgraduate conference on um, post-development 40 years on or something. I don't remember the, the exact title, but the, the thing that was um, being raised was we've been saying for 40 years there's a lot, that there is a lot, many things wrong with international development. We actually know, we've heard also like from post-colonial thinking, post-development thinking, feminist, critical feminist approaches, uh, decoloniality today that comes more to the foreground. Um, if we were cynical, we could say there's nothing new. We've been saying over and over. And even though even for myself, it took me ages to even be exposed to this thinking. Um, it's not the same as saying that this thinking has not been around for a very long time. So the question that remains with us is, how come we're still dealing with similarly the same questions, but mostly the same industry of aid and development? Uh, and it can't be that we are stuck with a whole bunch of people with bad intentions. And I think sometimes when we speak about the colonial as a moment in the past, also there, it's very easy to conflate the whole thing to only bad people that went to colonize the rest of the world. Um, it's not the, it was not the case then and it's not the case now. So that cannot be the, um, the argument. It's a bit like when we have discussions about racism. Racism doesn't exist because none of us is a bad person, hence, right? So it's, it's that fallacy in the thinking that does not help us uh, to move forward. So what, I, what I'm trying to do is basically um, combine some of the epistemic insights that we get from all these critical approaches and try and think if we take them seriously rather than just building careers out of being super critical and keep on producing papers on how everything is bad, what happens um, practically? Um, and so in terms of 
you know, a bit systematizing, but like very briefly and very simplistically in this context. I try to think of decoloniality as three strategies that are interlinked, but that somehow uh, allows to think in, in a practical way how to go about it. Um, first one is at the level of ontology. How do we see the world? Where do we start the story and all these things? And I think decoloniality would invite us to seriously demythologize say maybe it's the colonial if you're gonna do that or like how do you how do you and again that would bring me to the point of there is a need to really think in practical terms maybe especially why we would be reluctant to rethink our departments to rethink our institutions and once we do it um, this is somehow I think how we can marry much more uh, productively what we've been discovering for 40 whatever how many decades now and what seems to be continuing on an institutional practice, practical basis, on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you, Olivia. Like the other two, I thought you presented a necessary reminder about how ahistorical we actually, even with the best of intentions, often happen to discuss those notions, and that our points of reference are far too short when looking at how realities of today are created, because it goes much further back than the dominant discourse suggests. But sometimes even we enter the trap and lose sight of where are the real origins. Um, I remember a year ago uh, when SOAS suggested uh, to diversify, not to abolish, but to diversify the basic literature for the students by bringing in non-Western perspectives uh, as far back as 700, 800, 900 years. The public outcry, even in the mainstream established media about it, as if this is a cultural revolution where you abandon the achievements of the era of enlightenment, which actually, looking at it, was quite revealing because it reconfirmed that from the Western perspective claiming to be the universal, only legitimate perspective, is the dominant discourse since the era of the Enlightenment, and even overlooking that there were counter-narratives in the era of Enlightenment which argued very differently. Now, for me the dilemma is, and I guess most of you who are here and uh, share this debate, uh, is a similar dilemma. How do we manage being aware of the contradictions but then deal with them in our daily practices, beyond just being aware of it and saying, OK, that's it. And I think you posed that question at the end. How do we not only deconstruct the system, the theoretically, whatever, we say the right things, without being able to step out of the system? As scholars in academic institutions, which most of us, I would assume, we are, we are operating in an environment which makes it almost impossible if we want to pursue an academic career further to simply step out of the system. And I think that is one of the challenges. And uh, rather not going back to you, to the three of you, because we have half of the time already uh, spent, uh, I would like to invite those of you who were listening now to actively participate share your own thoughts on it. If you have direct questions, feel free to address it to any of the three presenters, but that we open up on an exchange along those lines. So please just show clearly your hands, uh, speak loudly, and introduce yourselves. Yes? Um, <coughs> My name is um, Lata Naraswamy, so I'm a lecturer in international development and policy at the University of Leeds. Um, thank you very much, very much for your interventions. Um, I'm, I, I suppose I'm so listening to to the ways in which I mean the Afghanistan examples, brilliant and absolutely horrible in equal measure. Um, and I wonder if um, there is there is perhaps an argument to suggest that some of these arguments are being had. So we're, so certainly in the way that we, you know, so I'm sitting here with a colleague, and how we teach international development, we don't start with Truman because it's the start of the story. The danger of not starting with Truman is that that is the start of the story. Not in that that's the beginning of history, but the thing that we know is development studies starts there. 
And for me, I use Truman, and my immediate thing I say after that is, this is a profoundly ahistorical approach to the world. This has just taken 500 years of colonial history and chucked it out the window. And Africans are poor because they're Africans. So that's the starting point. Now, if you wanted to turn that on its head and tell that, oh, that, that sounds to me also fine. But I wonder if the problem isn't about decolonizing. I wonder if it's that we need to colonize, as in we have forgotten the colonial history. We don't actually talk about that anymore in any way. So we don't make connections between um, refugee movements and the profound inequalities. The other thing that I think that, and, and, and it'd be interesting to know your thoughts on this, is I know that two of you are IR scholars. And I wonder if that is also the lack of dialogue. Because I feel like these are debates that have been happening in development studies for a long time. And we spend copious amounts of time being terribly introspective and in how we are holding up the system. And really, we shouldn't be applying for GCRF because we're just enabling it. And what are we doing? But hang on a minute, because my director of research is putting crap. You know, we, we play, we're rehearsing these arguments in our head over and over and over again. But we work in it. In it. Yeah, and, and, but we work in a school with IR scholars who feel, who are who just don't feel this pressure at all. They're not even worried about it. It doesn't even cross their mind. You know, and, and this idea that you know we are in international studies and there's nothing international about those international studies. And that so that example of the sort of the theory with, and, and the textbook and the lack of context, perhaps that's also about development studies needing an outward dialogue. I think there are plenty of us willing to have that dialogue. The question is, who is willing to listen? If we're going to actually decolonize, it can't just be about us, because it's the, what you rightly identified are the profound implications of that history for everybody else. How we know the world, what we study, who gets to study it? Isn't just about what we know and who we engage with, because we are all willing, we're all in this room, we're willing to have that dialogue. So if I wonder what the only thoughts be, how do we how do we have that, if I can use the term, that interdisciplinary dialogue, which is actually really, really difficult and is also a systemic issue because we're being incentivized to be siloed. How do we do that? We can't even do it down the hall. So anything you can tell us would be profoundly appreciated. Thank you. Are you okay if we invite we some more and yeah, then yeah. you are free to come no, back no, afterwards? I then I saw your hand. Yeah, um, my name is Dorothea Kleine. I'm Deputy Director of SID and the, it's the Sheffield Institute of International Development. And I mention that for a reason because, in a way, we collectively, as a, as a network of scholars, are also trying to navigate particularly those contradictions that you mentioned, Olivia. And I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to initiate those dialogues from the top, in a way, to make it easier for colleagues, especially early career colleagues, who, you know, they're keeping on top of the literature, duh. They're coming with, they're, they're very much confronted with this, uh, these kinds of contradictions, arguably, arguably sometimes in a way that other colleagues who sit on, you know, interdisciplinary advisor boards high up in the university or whatever, um, are, are much further away from the contradictory nature that you get in your head between some of the key debates that are happening in your area and then the latest GCRF call for collective hubs of 15 million or whatever it is. Um, and the discursive, co the, the discursive contrasts are massive, but also the cognitive dissonance that you get in your head is massive. If you, you know, one day you've got your writing day, you're engaging in sort of post-colonial kind of um, discourses, and the next day is your kind of justification of the hefty strategy for GCRF. But basically, I'm, I'm using all of these acronyms, it's sorry about that, but it's basically just telling you how I think the universities in the UK are deeply embedded also in the way that the UK still very publicly at the moment trying to work out its own identity um, and how the government has got, and this particular government has got a lot riding on that particular interpretation of that British history. So it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting time in, in Britain at the moment. I would invite colleagues from the Global South to use us as a field work site. <laughs> I think we are an excellent field work site at the moment. Um, uh, but um, 
maybe getting further from the comment bit to my question bit is in how far um, we can actually sort of countenance uh, the, the, the alternative scenarios. So if you're saying in a British scenario, is withdrawal the most ethical option? So, you know, is, is that the, is that ethical to basically say, you know what, you guys, biologist who's kind of after the big bucks, you've kind of done your sort of experiments on tomatoes in sort of your lab, you've noticed that actually the legislation in, the, in Africa for sort of gene manipulated tomatoes is much more lax, so it's a great space to try out your kind of particular field site. How about you go for that GCRF money and you write the application? And I'm not going to be involved because my job is to critique in my next, uh, next paper well, how GCRF is implicated in colonialism. You just go ahead. You've never worked in this context before. I'm not going to warn you about all the disasters that are in, in store for you. Um, and by the way, I'm washing my hands of your project. Um, that might be the case in this particular scenario. What about the engineer who's got a really good Wi-Fi amplifier that works brilliantly in one location uh, that they've been trying it out, but he's not sure whether it might be useful in a refugee camp. Should we help them to actually engage with that context? Or we should just say, you know what, we don't want to introduce Western technology in a refugee camp. You know, it'd be a West, it would be a British engineer who got an idea about a Wi-Fi amplifier. Let's not. That's like, you know, that would replicate knowledge in a very uncomfortable way, and it's got all of these colonial stories. So it's withdrawal in each of those cases, the most appropriate and ethical response. Mm. Or do we need to engage and accept the contradictions? Or, as social movements have done in the ages, should there be some of us who are shouting against the walls, while there's other ways who are in the system and you strategically work together because some people need to build a career within and some people need to create a career without. Thanks. Please. Uh, hello, my name is Roman. I'm a first year PhD student at the University of Warwick. My previous experience was working in NGOs uh, and what I found, what I found quite staggering uh, was that we kind of did not talk about perils and issues of development. We just kind of got on with it and tried to get as much as we can out of it. And Mike, what I was what really struck me when I was listening to all your excellent contributions was uh, to what extent we may feel that pushback against development from a critical perspective, so a sort of an inside perspective which is very highly critical of it while it's trying to do something positive. To what extent have you maybe seen that that is becoming instrumentalized by those by with a more anti-development, pro-trade, less aid type agenda. Mm. I take one more and then I think we go back because it's quite some heavy challenging questions. Other people might want to or, respond to yeah, yeah. Yeah. If they want. Yeah. But then you should indicate if it's more than a question <laughs> but a response. But first you. Um, it was just a small bit. Um, I'm Sam Stan from the University of Edinburgh. Um, I'm just interested in this kind of how we relate practice and awareness, and actually whether we need an awareness of decolonialism and decolonial sort of the literature and form development studies, perhaps, um, and how much um, our practices depend on an awareness and vice versa. Because actually, in terms of the interdisciplinary dialogue, for example, I think sometimes we try and essentialize or we end up essentializing other disciplines. So, for example, I work with natural scientists a lot, and many of them in their practices are very. You know, you'd assume it's a very sort of decolonial practice in the way that they engage with people working in the global south. They, you know, they sort of try and create quite a sort of equitable relationship, and, and you know, they attend to lots of the things that decolonial literature would tell us to attend to, but they don't know it as a theory. So I'm just sort of interested in that relationship between practicing and awareness. And anyone who wants to respond to something that has been raised from from the floor, or do you have another question? Well, if that's the only one left for now, then edit and then we come back to the room. Okay, my name's um, Sarah Cummings and I work um, part-time at the FU University in Amsterdam, but I'm really, I, I'm more of an activist really than a researcher and I see research as one form of activism, if you like. 
and um, I, Nivy, I thought your example of the machine gun was just so horrific. And there, but there are sort of other practices which are around. For example, I'm part part of a network called the Knowledge for Development Partnership, and we've developed. Um, I don't know if you realise, but the SDGs hardly ever mentions knowledge at all, and actually only mentions local knowledge once as a subset of bi biogenetic resources, and apart from that it appears to not exist. So we've developed a, something called an Agenda Knowledge for Development, in which we've developed 30 knowledge development goals, in which we, if you like, as an ad advocacy document, we've tried to address hierarchies of local knowledge, but also, for example, like what development organisations are doing knowledge terms when they're acting because they're big, powerful organisations. But also looking, for example, at the role of literature and culture, which don't appear at all in the SDGs. And this is also based on 120 statements, and Henning has also provided one of the statements, which is great. So what we're doing, I think, like people like me and also researchers and practitioners, we're making trying to do nice things in the margins, but really what we need is systemic changes. And how can these be brought about, like in the current political environment, which seems very repressive, but also in the university environment, which is so focused on in, um, monodisciplinary research, but also really like um, only on uh, knowledge products that not, unfortunately, obviously with these people it's not the case, but you know, very few articles are read and cited. Okay, then please don't feel obliged to answer every of the five uh, questions. Just pick the ones you feel closest to, and then we might have time for a second round. Okay, well, I, I don't know if I'll respond to any of the questions. I think that, I mean, it's really... I think Lata, what you say, absolutely. I mean, I support that, and Sam as well. I think it's re that, that they're really important questions. And somebody said to me yesterday, who hadn't been to a DSA for a while, said, well, I, I don't really, this was at the reception last night, I, I don't really feel that I am a development studies person anymore. I think development studies was kind of a thing of the 80s, <laughs> and really it shouldn't be there anymore. And earlier in the day, we had a meeting, a breakfast meeting, where we were thinking about development studies, and try to identify what was distinctive about it. As you, you, you were saying, Dorothy, about whether we should withdraw and let the you know, biologists move in or the agrarian <laughs> soil scientists. And um, so I think maybe a good starting point is if we, you know, why do we struggle so much when we try and define what development studies is? I mean, ge I'm a geographer and I don't feel that geographers ha struggle that much to define their discipline. And I think it's partly because we are multidisciplinary. Um, and I think also because we are linked to practice in particular ways, policy and practice like social work is. And so my feeling is that as a discipline, perhaps we are the critical discipline. Maybe we are a discipline which is looking at other disciplines, looking at other practice, looking at other theories, and providing some kind of critique and challenge to those. So I think it's not about withdrawal at all. I think it is about even more engagement in a whole variety of areas to critique, in a sense. And I don't mean critique in terms of pessim. I don't, you know, critique is not does not equal pessimism. Critique for me is incredibly progressive. It's very productive and it's very creative. And so it's not a move from create critique to you know, let's move on. Um, I think there is always, always a space for critique, and I think it is creative. So for me, that's why I feel that we have to just keep doing, even though it's been 40 years, whatever, we have to just keep, we have to be there. <coughs> we have to critique it. Maybe? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I also agree that we shouldn't withdraw, but I think there are times when politically it makes sense to cede our space for people who can do these things better. So it, without thinking of it as a passive activity, uh, if we're looking at redistributive sort of ways of thinking of the university, of uh, are quite, um, we, we have a lot of leeway in the ways in which we conduct research, and at least in terms of you know where we publish articles or who publishes in journals that we might co-edit and things, and to start thinking about ways in which maybe giving ourselves less prominence uh, even even if we are the critical voices uh, would actually be a 
a better way of thinking about a project that isn't that is actually egalitarian or actually opening up space. Um, so yeah, so maybe not withdrawal, but I think that there is definitely times when we should just step back and and um, in terms of disciplinary boundaries and stuff, yeah, I, but perhaps development studies is far more sort of progressive and enlightened than IR is. I think that that is probably true. But there are people in IR who are also doing. So my department uh, at Queen Mary and the University of London, there's you know loads of people like Robbie Shalim is one good example of somebody who's working on those questions. So yes, more cross-disciplinary uh, engagement, but also cross-institution engagement. How much of this is filtering down to anybody who's actually you know engaged with some of these things that we're talking about as knowledge producers, if you like, right? So so that um, and and then um, this has already been said by Henning, but. The colonial institution, I mean, the, the university is a colonial institution. We have to sort of recognize that too. Like, there's a lot of good things that comes out of universities, but we are also with the part of hierarchies and part of perpetuating an agenda which isn't always super progressive or decolonial. And, and it doesn't just mean, it, even this filters down and has local inflection. <coughs> so it's not like the university in India is automatically a decolonial institution, right? It's not, it's not an east-west, north-south thing. It's just the way these structures are permeated through colonization, through global globalization, whatever you want to call it. So I think that recognition and that awareness is, you're talking about awareness, it's not enough, but we definitely, uh, as academics who, who use, and this is coming back to your question about awareness, as academics who use theories to have decoloniality as a theory is important. If you're not using theories at all, I guess you are in some ways, but if you're not overtly using theories or not trained as a theoretician or whatever, then yes, absolutely, don't don't talk about realism and don't talk about liberalism. But when you're talking about liberalism and liberalism, then talking about decoloniality becomes absolutely crucial to to our role. Yeah. Um, so much to say. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to choose. Um, Yes, I think what, like to first follow up on, on what Nivi was saying, what is, um, what I find particularly insightful in decoloniality is that it, it allows us even to not just do theory. A lot of decolonial thinkers would even say like the one thing that decoloniality doesn't want to be because it's colonial way of producing knowledge and linear and increasement, everything is not wanting to be a theory because it would fix again uh, whatever we might be able to know in terms of laws and prediction and all these things. Um, again, simplification doesn't mean that other approaches have not had the same uh, thing. But um, I would say for me, decoloniality would be, first of all, an epistemic approach, but also an explicit politics. And, and in that sense, maybe the, the distinction, whether we do policy or practice or anything, is, is less important. And then the invitation there is, uh, especially if we try to navigate our own um, feelings of, of conflict, confusion, and all these things. And I have it in the classroom as well. We do all this beautiful deconstructive work. And you have a responsibility in the sense that I had students ask me, Olivia, but is there light at the end of the tunnel? And it can sound like joking, whatever. The only thing I can say is that not every day I wake up, I'm sure about it, but we don't have the, the luxury to say that let's not do anything. So, um, so in that sense, I guess, one of the liberating aspects can be that we need to move away from the desire to find one or unitary alternative answers to whatever we were doing before. And, and I think in some of the questions that, that we raise, often we think that we can somehow silence our anxiety if, if only we come up with then a blueprint for what to do next. And maybe the most, um, the most challenging thing is, is to let go of that without being super relativist in the sense that everything goes, that's not it. And that's why I think on a daily basis answering the normative question to yourself is what will guide you in that. And then I would say, and that's something I also tell myself, is that the one thing that I would distinguish development, the nice things about development studies, is that it's supposed to be about others in a good way and not about yourself. So all these anxiety things, and I have the same whenever we have big discussions about, let's say, about whiteness, white fragility, about racism and all these things. A lot of the things that come back is people wanting to know what is my place in this then, whatever color you have. But let's say from a Western positionality, we always come back to, okay, you tell us that all the stuff that we were thinking was bad, but what now? Like really dissenter your own position. In the, it's not about us. It is in terms of how we live together, but 
if one thing, the international development study should really be about how do I contribute to the good life elsewhere. And for me, withdrawal should be one of the options, but it's not the whole option and it's not the blanket option. But one of the examples that, again, um, especially for a lot of you that actually are in practice or, or doing this on a daily basis, uh, sometimes I use the, the example of the Ebola crisis, again, to show it's not an either or example. But um, in class we were using the, it's in the UK, and do they know it's Christmas time at all, whatever that song that was like revamped after 25 years with an equally horrible lyrics, whatever. So we analyzed those lyrics, but then also the pragmatism of the fact that it was launched during the X Factor, and in the first five minutes I think uh, there was like one, one million pound that actually came in. So I mean, I can be as cynical as I want, but money is money. So how do we, how do we navigate these things? You know, you can't just, uh, uh, and then I also showed an example of, um, of a song that was made by uh, West African uh, musicians at the same time. Again, not to say because it's West African, it's good. But you know, we, we compared somehow the lyrics of what was in these, <laughs> in these songs. And in a very symbolic way, you know, the ones trying to inform the world that Christmas exists. Uh, I would say that <laughs> to colonialism, you can be sure that everybody knows what Christmas is. And then the other song was really uh, about go to the doctor, do this, wash your hands, you know, like I do stuff that you can actually do something with. I guess my point and what I was trying to say to students is not necessarily to say I shouldn't send this SMS five quid or three quid, whatever, to that charity. I think the mistake we make is to actually think that that is being in solidarity. It isn't. As in, it can be a tiny part of it. But in how we study the global side and what happens there, often we conflate everything to these instant moments in which we do something that often have very, a lot to do also with how we feel about ourselves and our position in the world. And then it feels that if we keep on doing that often enough, then we have this aid system in which we try to alleviate instant stuff. I'm not saying that we shouldn't do that. People are dying to do something, right? But I would say that the decolonial invitation is to actually deconstruct this whole Ebola thing. And People don't die of Ebola, they die of where they contract it. And where they contract it, there is a whole historical genealogy to it, but there is also a very practical access to medication today. And that's stuff that's being decided in our European parliaments about patent laws and intellectual property rights and all these things. Mm -hmm. So if we don't change the content of our departments in how we conceive we can give AIDS, and we still focus very much on sending our 19-year-old to have a big adventure in the global south and come back with a great CV and then reproduce this, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's what, where I say the invitation is to take withdrawal seriously. And it's not withdrawal in the sense of I don't care, but maybe I don't have to impose my own presence, my own epistemic whatever, on the global south continuously to feel as if I'm doing something. Mm -hmm. Go and lobby at the EU if you want to, or in Washington, whatever. But again, it's not either or, but I think even conceptually, withdrawal um, forces us to be more creative in our either or questions. Let's go and see where we can do something else. Um, but yeah, let's not go and look for one answer because it won't be there, I think. Thanks, Olivia, for taking up something with which Umar started actually that uh, solidarity in mundane spaces of everyday life can and should take very different forms. So you can donate to some charity as long as you don't consider it that the kind of solidarity you restrict yourself. And if I may add, if you're truly in solidarity, um, guided by a notion of human dignity, then it's very difficult to find the way from the hotel in Portland Street to this place without being in deep shock, emotionally passing the zombies in each corner of Manchester Piccadilly Center who are spiced out in the true sense of the word. That's also part of a mundane, everyday life solidarity. It's not restricted to North-South relations. The dividing line is not between us here and them in some other geographical space. The dividing line is between the top and the bottom. Uh, I think that's also very important to keep in mind. But are there more questions, contributions, please? Yeah, I kind of strayed into the room, um, into the wrong room, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm an economist, and I suspect that there are not very many of us in the room. Oh, okay. but, but I, I was just kind of listening to... You're welcome. <laughs> ...to what you were saying, and thinking, okay, well, how would I look at it? 
And the first sort of comment I would uh, spill down is sort of the idea of progress as a kind of con contested space. So one of the things we have to think about is <coughs> what is progress? And as an economist, obviously I would look at economic things. And so it seems to me, as an economist, it's relatively easy to say what it is. You would say it's an improvement in the overall level of income and the distribution of income. And the, re the relationship between the two is... ...how we respond to what has happened in our own country in terms of economic growth and the indigenous people, non people. And it was going to hate me for I remember came to Nancy at the end of last year and did a seminar and I, was, I had a Maori colleague of mine who was there at that seminar and we walked out and I said to her, the hell that? Isn't it great? She was like, yeah, that was great. She said, there's nothing that we haven't been saying for the past 100 years. And this is the challenge I think that we have. And I think coming back to what you were saying about uh, withdrawal, in my context, withdrawal is not an option. It's not what Maori people want. It's not what, how, how this is going to be able to play out. But we have deep, deep challenges in terms of how to engage, um, what that engagement might look like. And I guess that's what I'm curious about. Um, I, I'm lucky, I, I teach um, development studies, but I also teach in uh, global citizenship with this Maori colleague, and she's informed a lot of what we do, and we're trying to bring some of that into development studies. But not everyone has the luxury. There's very few Maori academics. Um, and the ones that we do have are very overstretched, and so um, trying not to draw too much from them, but also trying not to speak for them is, is, is a challenge, it's not going to happen. Thank you. There was one more hand. If you keep it very short, I give you the space. I'm a chairman from uh, Sheffield Institute for International Development. A little bit of an, writing a, sort of an answer um, actually connects to what uh, you were saying about poverty. I think there are different types of knowledge uh, and within those uh, otherness, uh, within the, that otherness, we tend to assume that the only way to produce wealth or um, benefit or progress is through wealth. Uh, one of the things that uh, in, in, in indigenous communities uh, in, in Latin America perceive themselves uh, uh, within this world is that they are part of the world. They don't uh, own a piece of land. They don't own uh, the trees. They, they, are, they are living uh, as equal. That's one way of understanding um, what is, what is a, a, a benefit, a, 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 a good situation, a kind of a balanced situation. Um, with the world, and another uh, another thing that uh, just uh, thinking across um, short sure, story that Stella, uh, Stella, Stella tells about uh, when the, the, the Zapatistas started um, this uprising, a lot of uh, aid agencies and, and so on has immediately arrived. And the first thing that Zapatistas did is like, hang on. Mm. If you're going to stay here, you're going to observe. But this is a process that we will develop on our own. So I think there are different types of interventions, different types of dialogues we need to establish uh, for us to, to, to become um, more, or to work within this decolonizing narrative of uh, development. Thank you. Quick final round. We'll start the other way around, because yeah. <laughs> I'm going to forget the other way. Yeah, um, no, I really appreciate the questions about withdrawal, because it pushes us to be more specific about it. I think the example you gave, uh, the Zapatista example, is, is a perfect one. In a way, if we position ourselves as, as these development organizations that come, and if we, if, we, um, if we agree to be there as observers, it is a position of withdrawal in comparison to what we would do normally, right? Taking a space, giving advice, giving some money, maybe whatever. Uh, but I think in the example of, of uh, relationship between Maori uh, researchers or, or in any other context, because I think even in non-settler uh, Western Europe, let's say um, the absolute whiteness of the whole of the academy, whether that is in bodies or whatever, it's, it's, 
if we want to change that, it, inv it, it, it invites us to think about withdrawal if we are from a, a central positionality. But I would say that, following on your question, maybe we need to think about withdrawal to reconnect or withdrawal for relationality or withdrawal. So it's not a withdrawal where we say we take our hands off, but if we want a future in which we don't have to say there's so many, so few researchers, Maori researchers, or uh, they have been saying something for 100 years, and it's only when somebody like us that comes from the global north and says the same thing that is being heard, withdrawal in that sense means that you need to revisit all the stuff that has been seen as expertise up until then, that we couldn't even hear stuff that had been saying for. Mm. So that, I think that's my invitation, that it, none of these things will be recalibrated if we are from, from our positions of power, if we are not willing to change the relationships of power, and that involves conceptual withdrawal. And I don't know like how we, um, uh, and, and I would very much um, um, want to join the, the invitation to be much more explicit about the economic setup or the material aspects of any of these things that we were saying. I think that was the, the, last, um, the last bit I wanted to highlight in, in the three parts of the strategy. Um, the same way that for me, a lot of the international developments that these departments become untenable if I take the coloniality seriously. In the same way, um, a capitalist model to organize global economic life as the only model, and I'm being very generous here, but it's untenable in that sense. Um, so, so I would say that, again, maybe our question should not be, let's all find one answer of what progress is, mm. but take some step back and say, like, who gets to answer that question for whom? And do we need to have a question that goes for everyone? And I think a lot of um, our modernistic thinking has been in that direction, that we, by, by having a very systematic amnesia, cut out so many pieces of a story that is seemingly just economic in terms of you know, accumulation of wealth and everything. But if you can bring the capitalist story by cutting out all the ugly bits, then it seems quite plausible as something that we should reproduce for the rest of humanity. But, so in that sense, I would never say a country is just a country. It's where the point of history is so important uh, comes in. And that, that doesn't just go for the country, but also all the peoples that we see in our societies here, who is on top, who is at the bottom. And there are histories behind these things that, that would invite any economists in ourselves to engage with the historical and probably any historian you know, with, with the economic and all the other disciplines. And in that sense, I think yeah, the invitation is to, to think beyond disciplines, obviously. But, just to complicate uh, our stories, but mostly let's not try to answer really fundamental questions of, of life chances and possibilities for everyone. I think that in the Global North, that, that is our biggest invitation, I think. Thank you. Nibi? Yeah, thank you. No, Nibi has already said most of what I was going to say, and better, <laughs> so I won't reiterate that. But um, in terms of this question of can colonialism be untethered from capitalism, no, I don't think it can, and that's a really material and good question to ask. So a decolonial, a decoloniality for me would be anti-capitalist. That is the only way to think through those, those structures of power. And then that, that does mean that progress becomes viewed differently in different contexts and different spaces, as does the question of withdrawal. Sometimes strategic withdrawal makes sense, sometimes retreating, sometimes re reiterating. You read those situations differently. So in the case of uh, a controver the controversial case of Israel, I would say that me BDS makes sense. That means withdrawing our support for the state of Israel. But I'm not saying that lightly, and I know that there's consequences for that of that that don't that aren't always good. But a strategic withdrawal of sponsorship at that point, even as academics, uh, is overall uh, to me a more fruitful strategy than trying to change bits and pieces and piecemeal because that isn't working. Um, yeah, uh, that's it really. Um, just a couple of good, um, a couple of points to some very good good questions. Um, I think the the boundaries have always been blurred. I think development actually created that distinction between developed and underdeveloped. It's not that that's changed, even though we now talk about the new geographies of development. I think what we need to think about is what does development mean then if it's global? When and and I, th I do think in a way that there's a flattening out of countries and y you, you wouldn't be taking history into account if the country is just a country. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important. Sharon, I think that's such an important reminder. Um, and I think that's really important that we, 
we do understand, and in particular with settler colonialism, that there, that there is something actually quite different um, and expressed in very different ways. I think that's really important. Thank you for raising that. And a friend at the back, look, we wouldn't have a national health service. <laughs> we wouldn't have, you know, the, the, the food that we have. People still wouldn't know what garlic was. We, we you know, music, we wouldn't, we, so yes, you're absolutely right, you know, people coming over, my parents came over to Britain in the 50s. You know, there's, there's huge kind of colonial history around mobility, mobility of labor and ideas and individuals and, um, and ideologies. And I, and I think it's a really important issue that you raise is about, you know, if people didn't move. I mean, what would the Ghanaian Health Service be like if they hadn't sent all their nurses to Britain? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a really important issue that you raise, and it's beyond academia, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think it's, uh, in a different way, reminding us that uh, we are living in a global system which is reproduced globally. And maybe you actually made reference to the University of India, and that points to the fact that there are the intimate enemies, as Ashish Nandi called it. It's reproduced in the so-called southern society what is claiming to be a universal hegemonic project. Mm -hmm. So it brings back the contradictions to each and every society where the struggles are rather similar along those lines. Um, I think that's very important to remember. Now, where is the positive? Uh, I'm very much a fan of uh, the final sequence of Monty Python's Life of Brian. <laughs> Always look at the bright side. <laughs> and you started like that, Umar. You said, we have made major inroads. The fact that we are sitting here that we are engaging with that degree of seriousness on a topical issue, even if the debate goes back for decades. Mm. And especially in my view as an outside observer, the way the empire strikes back in Great Britain today leaves me flabbergasted. And then I think it is a sign, not of strength, but of weakness, because the strength is with us. We made the inroads, we occupy public discourse more than ever before, which forces the Oxford and Cambridge stones to abuse um, misconstructed academic freedom in defense of their ethnic, ethnic balancing of empire and do it behind closed doors. They would have done it in the public visibly 20 years ago. And no one would have worried about it or would have cared about it. So let's look at it like as, as a serious, strong encouragement we are making inroads, and we should leave and feel inspired by that and say we need to continue to fight the battle. I would like to end on a more personal note as I started. We have discussed human dignity, more or less, when it comes about the subject. And while I have most likely not been practicing the global injustice. I have, as a white male, always been a beneficiary of the global injustice. But I'm aware that the way we progress, we will, rather sooner than later, bring an end to life on this planet. So, the alternative discourses we are engaged in are discourses also to the benefit of this minority species I'm representing, maybe not intellectually, I hope, or emotionally, but the way I'm visibly looking. And I hope that many more in that small species are aware they are as endangered as a species as everyone else on this planet if we continue to be molded in that mindset and apply that mentality. And for that, I really personally, honestly would like to thank the three of you and all others here that you engage in these efforts to change this world. <laughs> thank you so much.